This is the scene earlier this morning, uh, just about uh, an hour and a half ago, when Stafford and Cernan, for the third time, uh, went aloft in that elevator uh, to uh, try to get off on Gemini 9. That's Deke Slayton uh, without the helmet on, without the hat, who uh, you saw carrying a baton-like device. That turned out to be a long uh, replica, supposedly, of a match stick given to the launch director, allegedly to help light the rocket for takeoff. That is Cernan in the darker uh, helmet visor there, that dark visor uh, to protect his eyes uh, during his spacewalk scheduled for tomorrow morning. Insertion into the spacecraft came uh, just uh, a little over an hour ago, as you see it uh, replayed here on tape. Perhaps you got a quick look at the darker pants that Cernan seemed to be wearing. That is the metallic pants, the iron pants that he will wear to protect his legs against the thrust rockets of his uh, astronaut maneuvering unit, the unit uh, with which he will propel himself through space in that two and a half hour space walk. That due tomorrow morning. About uh, 45 minutes ago, a little less than that, uh, they uh, retracted uh, the erector around the spacecraft, that 109 feet of Titan rocket and uh, Gemini spacecraft. And as it came back, uh, Stafford said it was a beautiful sight in the Cape. Cernan said, oh boy. Nelson Benton is down at the Mission Control Center, the Manned Space Center in Houston. He can tell us something about the decisions that will have to be made on a so-called real-time basis, that is a spontaneous basis on this flight. Nelson? Uh, Walter, that shroud you've been discussing is one of the things that has prompted the so-called real-time thinking. Chris Kraft told us yesterday that with the mission of Gemini 9, there will probably be more of this uh, real-time planning, in other words, choosing alternatives, than there's been on any previous space flight. This they had expected as a result of rendezvous. Rendezvous is a, un, still a partly undetermined thing. But the delays and the problems that have been encountered in Gemini 9 have sort of compounded this. In other words, Walter, there are more questions. However, I suppose uh, space exploration is a matter of questions and a matter of answers. Walter? Uh, Nelson, uh, as you know uh, from what, what you've heard down there, they plan uh, their first all alternate plan in case that shroud is on there when they get up uh, that knocks out the docking maneuvers all of the rendezvous maneuvers and the spacewalk can still take place and they will in that case do all of the rendezvous the three major rendezvous maneuvers first of all the rendezvous from the earth that is the third revolution rendezvous uh, from uh, here from the launch uh, then a rendezvous uh, sort of an eyeball rendezvous without the use of radar just the onboard computers and line of sight and use of the sextant, uh, real space navigation attempt to find the spacecraft again, the unmanned spacecraft. And then the third rendezvous, a rendezvous from above, so-called, simulating uh, the recovery of a LEM, a lunar excursion module, a landing ship for the moon, uh, back to the mothership in case the landing vehicle couldn't make it to the moon and uh, was stranded somewhere between the moon and the spaceship. This would uh, simulate the recovery of that lamb by the spaceship. All that would take place, uh, well, the first two would take place today. The walk would then take, uh, the, the, the rather the third rendezvous attempt, that uh, rendezvous from above, would take place tomorrow morning, followed by the spacewalk tomorrow morning. Dallas Townsend in New York uh, can, is following uh, what's going on in the tracking network around the world, and he can give us a rundown on the weather around the world in just one minute. This is Dallas Townsend of the CBS News Space Center in New York. One of the methods by which we'll be keeping you posted on the progress of Gemini 9 is our Colesman map here in our New York studio. And we'd like to tell you just a bit about what you'll be seeing on it. First, this flashing symbol of the ATDA, the Augmented Target Docking Adapter, already in orbit now for two days. The line shows the track of the ATDA, the track of where it's been. 
We'll also have symbols of the spacecraft in its track once GT-9 is in orbit. The circles indicate tracking stations, just for example, those at Carnarvon in Western Australia and Hawaii in mid-Pacific. Incidentally, ATDA passed over Carnarvon just a few minutes ago on its 29th pass. There and elsewhere all around the world at this hour, thousands of people of many different nationalities are standing by waiting to play their own very important parts in the success of the GT-9 mission. These are the people who man the worldwide network of tracking stations, miniature control centers strung out around the face of the globe like a necklace, all in touch with mission control in Houston and enabling Houston to keep in touch with astronauts Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan throughout the three-day mission. One of those you'll probably be hearing a lot about is Carnarvon in Australia. It will be talking with the astronauts and exchanging vital information as the spacecraft indicates and executes some of those difficult maneuvers on its way to rendezvous. Another is the tracking station in Hawaii. At that critical moment, it will give the astronauts the order to go for their first docking attempt. And of course, there are many others. Weathermen around the world are keeping careful watch. Right now, the reports from all the main recovery areas are good, with excellent visibility. In the main recovery area in the western Atlantic, a report from the carrier WASP says the weather out there is just beautiful, with a calm sea and just a very slight wind. A very quick look now at how today's rendezvous mission will look on our Colesman orbital map. As the target vehicle passes over the United States, some 185 miles up over Cape Kennedy, Gemini 9 will be launched in pursuit. There you'll see the two of them, the two astronauts in Gemini 9, beginning about 700 miles behind and far below, but gradually moving up and closing in. This is, of course, a very much speeded up version of the chase throughout space that will actually take four hours and will involve a series of complicated maneuvers by the Gemini spacecraft. The two vehicles will finally meet at their appointed rendezvous over the Indian Ocean. And then they will fly formation for a while, just a few feet apart, before Gemini starts the first docking maneuver high above Hawaii. That rendezvous, just a few hours from now, will be the fastest rendezvous in space history, one whole revolution of the Earth faster than occurred in Gemini 8. Now back to Walter Cronkite at Cape Kennedy. Here at the Cape, but plus everything is going uh, swimmingly, I'd say. The weather is really extraordinarily good compared to last Wednesday. Uh, there are just a very few scattered clouds and a very high, very high, but very light haze. Uh, we ought uh, to get a very good view, as will the tracking cameras themselves, of the launch phase uh, of the Titan this morning. Uh, with the countdown now at 11 minutes and 45 seconds uh, with that uh, four minute to built in hold so it's about 15 minutes uh, to the actual launch time. The families uh, of this 35 year old uh, balding uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Tom Stafford uh, are in Houston uh, that is his wife and their two young girls and uh, so is the family of Eugene Cernan, his wife and their one quite young daughter. Cernan, at 32, is the youngest of our astronauts yet to go into space. We're all assuming, of course, he is going this morning. They're holding the word and the thought here at Cape Kennedy that this is going to be the day Gemini 9 gets off. This is an historic day in our space program. It was just a year ago that Ed White made his walk in space, and Herb Kaplow uh, has uh, a talk with Ed White in Houston. Jim McDivitt and I did during the next 20 minutes. I think this one is going to dwarf the work, though, that we did a year ago today when they go out there and spend up to almost three hours out in space. How does it actually feel when you're out there? Is it a sensation of floating or what? Well, it took me about uh, oh, 100 pages to describe it in the debriefing, so I think it'd be very difficult in just a few minutes to describe it to you now. It's something that's hard for somebody to grasp to step out and not feel 
any different uh, going 17,000 miles an hour, but it's the uh, lack of the gravity out there, and it's just like swimming in a great big tank of water. That's probably the closest analogy I can give you. What sort of work have you been doing with the with Cernan and other pilots who have or have had EVA mission schedule for them? Well, it's been a, quite a bit of time since I have flown, and after I flew, we had these flights scheduled. Uh, we worked and talked together, and I tried to convey to them all the things that I had learned and any difficulties that I had, and I think they've taken these briefings that uh, we uh, talked over and, and have pretty well gone through the problems that we had on my flight and uh, cleaned them all up. Are there any major problems involved in the EVA? No, I don't see any major problems at all. There are little things that a bulky hatch that's been cleared up and mm. such things as that. But it can be done. It sure can. Thank you very much. Sure. We'll, Thank you, Herb. We'll let you get up. They've uh, changed that bulky hatch uh, by putting in a call arrangement uh, whereby they can get some leverage on the hatch cover to close it. You remember they were a little concerned after they brought the umbilical back in from Ed White's flight that they could, whether they're going to get it closed or not. And uh, they probably couldn't have re-entered, gotten back safely if they could not have gotten that hatch closed. But that's been taken care of now. This walk is going to be quite a bit different from Ed White's walk. Uh, this will be the first time that anybody has walked in space. There have been only two before. Leonov, the Russian, was the first one. He was out only a few minutes, about less than 10. And uh, White was out uh, considerably longer than that. But this will be the first time that uh, after vehicular activity has taken place with out a or just a safety strap, really. Uh, the man and really will be uh, independent out there in space. Downrange, we can see from our live uh, television cameras the aircraft carrier WASP. It's radar, uh, radar antenna circling above the craft there. A uh, quick picture that we did lose, but uh, an excellent picture, and we're looking forward to again having live television of the recovery of these astronauts on next uh, Monday morning. Speaking again of that, uh, the differences in this uh, spacewalk from the previous ones, uh, when Cernan dons his astronaut maneuvering unit there in the back end of the spacecraft uh, after uh, his first uh, tentative step to the space, puts that on and floats out. He will be in every uh, sense free of the spacecraft entirely except for a 125-foot nylon line, uh, which is a safety feature in case anything goes wrong. Uh, Stafford could reel him back in on that line, of course, and he couldn't go floating out into space. But otherwise, that AMU, Astronaut Maneuvering Unit, is self-contained. It's got its own oxygen supply, its power supply, uh, its maneuvering unit, and uh, uh, its communications back with the spacecraft. That ought to be uh, really a, a historic first in space when that walk takes place tomorrow morning. With the count at 6 minutes and 40 seconds, uh, with uh, an extra 4 minutes of hold built in there, uh, CBS News color coverage of Gemini 9 will continue in a moment. Back here at Cape Kennedy, waiting for the launch of Gemini 9. The third attempt to get up this uh, manned flight that is scheduled to rendezvous with an unmanned target vehicle that has been circling for two days since it was launched on Wednesday morning and uh, to give Eugene Cernan, 32-year-old Navy Lieutenant Commander, a two-and-a-half-hour walk in space. The actual time to lift off is nine minutes now. The countdown at five, but there's a four-minute hold built in. To that uh, operation to give the chance for a last-minute correction uh, of any uh, any correction that is needed uh, in the azimuth, the launch direction of this uh, rocket so that it will meet on the third orbit with its unmanned target uh, up there in space. There has been a great deal of levity this morning about this flight, apparently, although uh, Stafford and Cernan certainly looked serious as they went up the elevator. Uh, there was a sign waiting for them up there, signed by their backup crew, saying, we were kidding before, but not anymore. Get yourselves into space or we'll take your place. Now let's go to Mission Control and uh, Jack King. <laughs> 